You may have heard of Dr. Lorraine Eden on The Fiona Show. Episode 29, Is the Arm's Length Standard Really the Problem? When she gave us a very impassioned defense of the principle that's become the backbone of transfer pricing. Well, today she's back, this time leading the charge about the sorry attempt at BEPS Action 1, the taxation of the digital economy known to you as Pillar 1. Hello, everyone. It's Matthew DeMello, your host of The Fiona Show, Cross-Border Solutions Weekly Transfer Pricing Podcast, where you can dive deep into transfer pricing topics and earn CPE credits while you do it. That's right. We've planted two code words in this podcast. Listen for them and send them to The Fiona Show at xbs.ai, and we'll reply with your certificates. Here's where you'll hear it all. The ins and outs of technical transfer pricing, service transactions, anyone? Country-by-country transfer pricing coverage, and always what's up at the OECD. But my favorite shows are ones like today when we get a hot topic that's being covered everywhere in the news and a know-it-all expert who's not afraid to say what she really thinks. And believe me, folks, today you're going to get an earful of thoughtful critiques. I mean, let's be real, criticisms about Pillar 1. But before we get started on where the OECD went wrong, I mean where some experts see room for improvement, let's take a look at transfer pricing in the news. If we had to pick one word to describe Dr. Eden, it would be straight shooter. Wait, does that even count as one word or two? Well, anyway, an emerita professor of business at Texas A&M University and renowned author, Dr. Lorraine Eden is one of the world's leading experts on transfer pricing. At A&M, she created a graduate seminar solely devoted to transfer pricing. More than a third of the 350 students who have taken it are now transfer pricing professionals. Not a bad way to pass the baton, wouldn't you say? The woman lives, breathes, and writes transfer pricing. One of her first books, Multinationals and Transfer Pricing, see, even her titles are straight shooting, was published in 1985 and then backed by popular demand in 2017. This year, she published The Economics of Transfer Pricing, and her latest book, Research Methods in International Business, will debut in 2020. Spoiler alert, her 10th book, tentatively titled Principles in Transfer Pricing, is already in the works. Let's not forget her articles appear in scholarly publications like the Academy of Management Journal and the Canadian Journal of Economics, and also on authoritative websites like MNE Tax. In fact, she recently wrote an article for Bloomberg Tax, Pillar 1 is not BEPS 2, and that's what she's going to be talking talking about with us today. Welcome, Lorraine. I also just want to make a quick note. Executive producer for The Fiona Show, Mary Lynn Mitchum-Strom will also be joining us, but I want to take this opportunity to welcome Lorraine. Lorraine, how long have you been teaching transfer pricing? Uh, I've been teaching a course on trans, a whole course on transfer pricing since 2007, so I guess that's 11 years. Wow. I've been teaching classes on transfer pricing going all the way back to the like individual classes on transfer pricing going back to the 1980s. Wow. Do you feel the interest in transfer pricing is growing among students? Oh, absolutely. Uh, up until a few years ago, most students, if you ask them, had no idea what transfer pricing was. Right. Now there's so much of it in the newspapers. If you pick up the Wall Street Journal or The Economist or Business Week, you see things on it all the time. Great. So yes, I know much more now. And what are some of the, the questions that they commonly ask you about transfer pricing? Well, the first one they always ask is about jobs. <laughs> Of course, every student is interested in what they're going to do after graduation. Uh, so that's the first question. Uh, the second one is they really are interested in what it is and, and how you do it as a transfer pricing professional. What does, the, what does the job entail? What are the questions that are being asked? And then thirdly, I think they ask about the general perception in the public that transfer pricing is somehow a very nefarious thing. It's an illegal activity. And so I get asked questions about that. And what mistakes do you see multinational companies making all the time? Well, I think the major mistake uh, they make these days is failure to document uh, adequately their transfer pricing policies. And one of the reasons why that matters is if you haven't got good documentation in place, the government can ignore it and impose its own rules. So it's a necessary precondition to have really good documentation. 
And now that we've gotten to know you a little bit better, Lorraine, let's dive into your academic and journalistic work. The OECD's unified approach, or Pillar 1, is one of the most recent attempts to find international consensus on BEPS action item 1, taxing the digital economy. What are the key issues at stake in the unified approach? I think, uh, let me back up just a second, Matt, and say, as in case people aren't aware, the work on the taxing the digital economy was started by the OECD really a couple of years ago uh, as part of the BEPS project. But it really heated up starting in January and with the publication of this sort of first piece coming out of a group of countries, originally the G20 and the OECD, trying to figure out how to tax um, primarily digital multinationals and digital transactions. And it went through a variety of iterations of different documents over the last few months. And what happened was the OECD secretariat was trying to get a, a large group of countries to come to some agreement. And there were a variety of proposals floating around out there. And over the summer, the Secretariat looked across all those proposals and decided there had some common elements across them and wrote a proposal picking the common elements. And that's why it's called the unified approach, because it took all the other different proposals and pulled out the common elements. And in fact, trying, it's like somebody was cooking five or six different cakes, all right? You know, a chocolate cake and a strawberry cake and a vanilla cake. And, um, and then all the cakes had flour in them. And so as a result, we pulled together the common elements and tried to create a new cake made out of these common elements, which is called the unified approach. Now, What's at stake here in, in this proposal uh, is really trying to figure out how does one tax digital economy transactions. We're, we do believe we are moving into uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, we do have many more digital multinationals. We have digital transactions. And the question is, how do you tax these things that are so, so mobile? The unified approach really focuses on a couple of things. One is who gets to tax these multinationals? And there are old rules for doing it, and the proposal was new ones. The second one was this debate about whether we should do a multilateral approach of trying to get all the countries together to handle this or let countries go unilaterally on their own. And then I think the third piece of this issue is what do we do about the existing rules of the system, and do we need to... Uh, tear the whole house down in order to build up something that can last into the 21st century. At least that's how the OECD, I think, has pitched this as the key issues involved. What were some of the initial concerns with taxing digital m &Es? Well, I think the whole idea of digital transactions is that, that they, are, they happen virtually. Uh, no real products necessarily move. And so just even finding out what went where is one issue, and then who earned the profits from it and who should have the right to tax. So let me just give you an example, just a really simple example. I have a Kindle app on my iPhone. I suspect you probably do too, and I buy Kindle books quite regularly. So if I'm sitting up in Canada and I see a new Kindle book gone on sale for $1.99 that I want to buy, I can buy it in Canada. Amazon's in the United States, mm -hmm. all right? And um, I might read that book anywhere. I could read it on an airplane, flying over the Atlantic, going to France, shall we say. So where do you count that transaction? Mm -hmm. Do you count that transaction where the parent firm is on the west coast of the U.S.? Do you count it where I bought the book in Toronto? Do you count it where I read the book? This is the issue. We're not really sure what happened. And then, of course, who made the book? Who actually turned it into a Kindle book? Where were the individuals? Where's the author located? Any of these places could be parts of where the profits were, were created mm -hmm. and done. But the idea behind here in this proposal in Pillar 1 is to allocate some of it to where the eyeballs are. 
where I read it, where I bought it, where I read it. So it's not so much where value is created, it's where value is used. We're not really sure. The way we have been using the rules in the past on transfer pricing was to basically tax where value was created along the value chain from extraction of the raw materials out of the ground all the way down to where the consumer is. So we measured the overall profits of the firm from a, trans from a product that you and I bought then we divvied up that profits um, along the chain. But we didn't allocate any of those profits to the consumer, right? Yeah. I, as a consumer, I, the eyeballs that read the book I bought uh, on my Kindle app, none of the profits were allocated to me mm -hmm. and therefore taxable where, you know, down here in Texas where I live or on the plane where I read it or in Toronto where I bought it. And so this allocation of taxing rights is what Pillar 1 is all about. There is that uh, famous Senate hearing where the late Senator John McCain asks Tim Cook of Apple, where does the company pay taxes? Because at that point, there were so many stories about how little they were paying or in how rigorous their tax avoidance strategy is. And we are enormous, both in terms of their uh, valuation and in terms of their sales worldwide. And they're all headquartered in the United States. Right. And so basically you have five enormous multinationals. As a matter of fact, if you look at the list of the top 100 digital multinationals that Fortune put out, 40 of those top 100 are American. So you have these enormously profitable multinationals, and there's a perception that they are, quote, unquote, not paying their fair share of taxes. Right. So it's like, when, it's like frankly, a little bit like when um, gold was discovered in California. And there was a huge rush of people moving to California in the 1800s to prospect for gold. These multinationals are very much seen as the new gold in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And um, clearly governments want to tax a piece of, of that pie. Of that and so I think of it as a virtual uh, tax grab, basically, of these large digital multinationals and saying their profits should be taxed in my jurisdiction, you know, where the book is read, uh, for example, for Amazon on the Kindle. And I just want to take a quick moment to interrupt and ask Fiona. Fiona, who are the big five and why are governments so eager to tax them? The Big Five are the largest digital companies in the world, Alphabet, which is home to Google, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Microsoft. They make up 5% of the GDP, according to Dr. Eden's article, and tax authorities are eager to tax them because they are highly profitable and seen as not paying their fair share. Bet you haven't heard that before. Ha, ha. Huh. <laughs> yes, uh, very funny, Fiona. Uh, I'm also going to interrupt here with our first CPE code word, and that word is unhappy, as in Dr. Eden is very unhappy with the Pillar 1 proposal, if I may be so bold. And back to you both. Yet the empirical evidence, and there's not been a whole lot of tests on it, but the empirical evidence does show that digital multinationals, on average, pay the same percent of, of taxes as non-digital multinationals. Now, admittedly, that's a European database that was used on, uh, but the, the presumption that there's this huge amount of money that's not being taxed, I think, uh, is, is more, a, um, it's more a, a hypothetical argument than any documented real proof so far. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, I guess because they bring the users into it right now. So, so many countries feel like they're participating in a sense with the profits. So they sort of deserve a piece of, of the tax revenue. It, it is a me too argument. Yes. Okay. Uh, the argument is that where my consumers are, that we're buying digital products, we are somehow creating value through our, our eyeball, our contribution, and that should be taxable. Yeah. Uh, that's the argument you see. And now that argument is usually used in conjunction with social platforms. 
Mm-hmm. So it's used for Facebook, for example, mm-hmm. that my likes on Facebook and my comments on Facebook or my pictures that I post to Instagram are creating a network community that then enables Facebook or Instagram to monetize it through the sale of advertising. And that because we contribute to the monetization indirectly through our likes and our our photos being added, that is creating a value that should be taxable, taxable income. And it's a theoret- it's a theoretical argument, but I don't think it's been proved yet uh, by the economists that simply having eyeballs creates value in the same way that having data in and of itself may not create any value until the data is put together with algorithms that can make sense of the data. And then there's the G24 plan drafted by India that spreads the taxable income across market countries or in terms of the question over consumer facing companies, those markets where the eyeballs are. I think uh, there's several things going on on here, Matt. One is different countries play out differently in terms of these proposals. In other words, the proposal is to take all consumer-facing businesses, which is basically all businesses, because they all at some end face consumers either directly or indirectly, and to allocate a a share of their profits to so-called market jurisdictions. And again, we're not very clear what a market jurisdiction is, but clearly one would think China and India and the United States, for example, would all be market jurisdictions. Countries with large populations and rich countries, not just large populations, but large and rich countries, one would think on this would be allocated a larger share. So, for example, if I were India, I would like people counted, but not by per capita income. From the United States, you would want people based on per capita income and spending counted. Right, because there are fewer people here, but their spending is a much larger amount. If I'm a small country, um, my market share is going to be very, very small, unless I'm very small and high income, like, say, Switzerland. But a small country that is low income seems to me to be can't possibly win on this at all, because they don't have enough eyeballs and they don't have enough per capita income to generate the the sale. So the one worry is that a, a, one of the real losers out of here will be small jurisdictions that uh, are not high per capita income jurisdictions. Right. But different countries will have different views. The G124, which is a group of um, big emerging market countries like India and China uh, and Brazil, but also includes a lot of small developing countries and a lot of African countries, for example. Some of them would be winners and a lot of them would not from a proposal uh, based on on Pillar 1. We haven't seen, one of the interesting things is though, the OECD secretary has been doing some work behind the scenes on winners and losers, but nothing's public. Interesting. So we don't even really know. All I'm doing is hypothesizing that if you allocate based on population or per capita income and population, we can tell who the winners will be and who the losers will be. As a result of this eagerness, many countries have come through with their own digital service taxes, which you describe as one of the immediate threats of Pillar 1. Can you tell us about those and why the DSTs can be seen as an immediate threat? Sure. Uh, Let me start by backing up. Um, You probably have an Amazon account like I do. I've had an Amazon account, I think, pretty much almost since it opened. (laughs) And any time I bought anything on Amazon, there was no sales tax on it. Well, uh, you bought transactions for Christmas just like I did, and I bet you paid sales tax every on almost every Amazon or maybe all Amazon transactions you bought. That came about because Amazon negotiated with the states inside the United States to say if you had a warehouse, in that state for delivery, then you would pay tax in that state based on the sales you made in that state. And I'm in Texas, and clearly Amazon has warehouses here. Mm -hmm. And so Amazon pays a digital services tax to the state of Texas 
that is some percent of the sales that happen here. And as I buy things, depending upon where they come, the tax rate varies. Some states have done this in the U.S., a lot haven't, and the rule has been basically, did you have a warehouse here? No. Digital services taxes are starting to spread internationally, too. So France was the first one with a proposed digital services tax, and they're doing a very sort of similar thing. They're basically saying, if Amazon is selling in France, we think you should be paying some kind of a tax here. Now, it's a little bit different because Amazon's an American multinational, and it paying sales taxes to, you know, U U.S. states is not the same as France taxing it. And if France simply taxes all remote sales by Amazon that happen in France, that is very close to a tariff. Yeah. Tariffs are taxes that are levied on imports, right? And if France is really taxing all of Amazon's sales into, into France, it could really just be a tariff or a customs duty, and it could be then illegal under the WTO. So it depends upon how you set it up. For example, it might be possible to set it up and say, Amazon, if you've got warehouses here, we consider your warehouse basically effectively a permanent establishment, we think, you have a real business here, and you are, in effect, have a, uh, a branch here, and we are going to tax you based on that. That would be somewhat of what's in Pillar 1. One of the proposals in Pillar 1 is to expand the definition of what a permanent establishment is and to include the fact that Amazon is actually making sales in France possibly through warehousing, then the books get delivered or whatever else you got and bought on Amazon got delivered uh, by creating virtual permanent establishments. But what's happening is the spread of digital services taxes is happening unilaterally and there is no consistency across them. So some of them are similar to what we're paying here in the United States that I'm paying in Texas that got negotiated between Amazon and the good government of the state of Texas. So they're doing it based on whether you've got a warehouse here. Some of them are just simply going after all sales of Amazon or all talking about any digital sales that happen. Some of them are taxing, if it's Facebook, for example, and it's advertising revenue, they're saying we want after Facebook's advertising revenue. Uh, some of them are taxing digital services, like India has a proposal for a digital services tax. And it's saying, if you're providing a digital service to me over long distance, we are going to tax you on this. So there is a proliferation happening of these types of taxes of digital transactions. And I think it's almost like letting a thousand flowers bloom here now. Each government trying to get a piece of that virtual tax pie in a way that makes most sense for its own jurisdiction. And that's what prompted the OECD to move much faster. They didn't want this unilateral spread. And clearly, the United States, where 40 out of 100 of these are headquartered, doesn't want them all taxed. And as you know, Donald Trump has threatened retaliation on French wine right. uh, for the digital services tax in France, for example. Yes, very painful, by the way. <laughs> If you're a fan of French wines, yes, you're <laughs> suffering right now. One of the main points you mention is timing. The OECD has left only nine months between the policy note and the unified approach, and the OECD wants to reach a consensus by the end of 2020. Do you think the deadline is driving the project more so than curbing base erosion and ensuring that profits uh, are taxed where economic activities occurred? Uh, well, I don't think the second reason has anything to do with it at all, Matt. Frankly, um, the paper that I wrote with Oliver Treidler, which basically says Pillar 1 is not BIP 2, basically makes the argument that all the things that were driving BIP 1, which was base erosion and profit shifting, hasn't got anything to do with what's going on under Pillar 1. Pillar 1 is not about base erosion. It is not about profit shifting. It is all about a virtual grab, virtual tax grab or virtual land grab, of saying, we think um, 
there are a lot of governments that need revenues, and they see this as an easy way to make money by putting on a group of, of digital taxes, whether they're digital sales taxes or digital service taxes. And so this cropping up of all of these individual taxes is what motivated the OECD Secretariat to move on this. I think very much pushed by the U.S., frankly, because, of, as I said, most of them are headquartered here. Uh, right. So the people who are pushing the digital taxes, not in the U.S., although the states, as I said, have done this for Amazon, and there are new cloud computing regs out from the IRS, which is going to help tax cloud computing. Uh, there's the Wayfair case, which is Wayfair, you know, is where you can buy furniture online. And you've had a state saying, we want to be able to tax sales of Wayfair in our state. So there is stuff going on in the United States here at this, too. But the focus of the United States has not been internal domestic. It's been on France and India and even Canada has proposed bringing in a digital a digital tax here. So my own view is the, the nine-month thing, and that was really just simply counting up from the first proposal in January to Pillar 1. There were nine months there, and we realized, gracious, you know, is this a new tax baby that survived? Uh, interestingly enough, uh, from the U.S. Treasury, there was a letter sent to the OECD this past week that basically comes out and says we're not very happy with Pillar 1 and that uh, we think maybe um, this should be an optional thing. And there's a note response back from the OECD this week saying without the U.S. we don't see how we can go forward on Pillar 1. And my own view is that I hope Pillar 1 dies a, a quick and easy death <laughs> and doesn't keep it, frankly. Um, I think that it's, it's co completely contrary to the original BEPS 1 proposal had a different agenda, uh, was put together, as I said, taking bits and pieces of different cakes and slapped That's together right. in a hurry to try and make something that could get signed by 124, now 135, uh, countries. Way too fast, way too soon, and contrary to the existing systems on which we've had in place uh, since um, the 30s. Well, I, I wanted to ask, I know we keep hearing that uh, the OECD is looking for a consensus um, by the end of 2020. Yeah. What, what do they need to agree on by the end of January? Because I know they have an, another uh, stage here that they want to wrap up by the end of January. What are they looking to, to determine? Well, one of the, that's, a, that's a really good question. My thinking was, remember there were 15 action items. Right. 14 of them have been handled. The 15th one got left because they thought it was going to be the most difficult. They picked up the 15th one. It was a January document, original January document. And the original group, which was the G20 and the OECD, expanded now into this much larger group of 135 countries self-imposed a timetable on themselves to get this done okay. so they committed so there's a, a frankly a face argument a loss of face argument if you can't get done what you all committed to doing and i think that's kind of what's driving this um it is possible you know there's going to be an election in the united states maybe they wanted it done before the next u.s election i'm not sure okay um but I think in some sense, the idea was the BEP project started in 2013. The um, action items came down in 15. Most of them were implemented by 17. They just want to get this thing done. In some sense, it's been a marathon race. This is the last one. They want the thing finished. And I think the OECD secretariat wants to uh, basically get that 50 action item done and signed through this pillar one and and pillar pillar two, so it's in some sense a self-imposed deadline. Let's talk about what the unified approach proposes. It suggests that market jurisdictions would be allocated in three pieces of an m and group, global profits, three slices of the global pie, as you say. Tell us about amount A, B, and C. 
Okay, um, they're complicated, so I will try to make it as simple as I uh, I can. Perfect. Amount A gets called um, new taxing rights, but basically this is the one most people talk about. This is the one where you're going to reward the eyeballs. You're going to shift profits to quote unquote market jurisdiction. And the original proposal was to do it just for digital economies. Remember, we talked about what started this was the, the big five um, digital multinationals and the wanting to get at their taxes, their their profits by more taxes, and say we want the market jurisdiction where the eyeballs are to get a piece of the pie. So amount A is about that, and basically what it does is it says. Uh, we, are, we, we are going to take multinationals, and the question is, who, oh, which one? And the original proposal was just go after the digital ones, but it has now been broadened to basically, as far as I can tell, all consumer-facing businesses, which is basically most of them. And so basically the multinational is supposed to tell you what its average worldwide return on sales are. How they're supposed to figure that out, we don't know. <laughs> but once they determine what that number is, they're supposed to split that number in two pieces. One piece that is a routine return, and that number is coming out of thin air. And what's left is called non-routine returns. The non-routines then get split into two, and there's some percent of the non-routine that is allocated basically to... Um, what we might think of as patents, intellectual property rights for patents. Um, and the rest of it is supposedly uh, intangible called a, it's not a marketing intangible, because we know what marketing intangibles are. It's intangible piece, really what it is, the piece of the pie we're earmarking off for market jurisdiction. Most multinationals are going to have to figure out what their worldwide return on sales is, worldwide, okay? Once you know what that ROS is, that return on sales is, they're going to split that in two pieces. One piece that is a routine return. The typical one people are talking about is 10%. Okay. So 10% that goes into a routine return. And then the rest of it, the 90% gets split again between um, intangibles that are related to, let's say, patents, um, brand names, whatever. We're not clear, but one part of it gets split. Okay. Say, let's say, I don't know, let's say 90% of it gets split. 10% of it gets allocated to market jurisdiction. So you'll hear the you'll pe hear people talk about 10-10. 10-10 means 10% of it is routine, that's the first cut, and the second 10 is a 10 for the market, market jurisdiction. But it could be 50-50, split between routine and non-routine. Once you figure that in, and then the question is, who are the market jurisdictions? Nobody knows, Okay. right? And then I uh, suppose I identify, I'm a market jurisdiction, you know, some percent of Amazon sales happen in my country. So suppose out of the 135, all 135 count as market jurisdiction. Then you need an allocation key to split the money up between them. So now we're back to where we started on the conversation talking about India. India is an enormous country. Think about the people in India. If you just count the people in India, they should get a very big share. So should China. The United States is a much smaller country population-wise, but if you look at by spending, the U.S. share is actually bigger than the share for China or for India. So if we're doing an allocation key just based on counting eyeballs, you're going to get a very different allocation than an allocation key based on my share of, of spending. And if I'm a small little tax haven with 100,000 people living there and very few sales, I'm going to get next to nothing out of here, right? Right. So the amount A is really a, a grab by the big market where the big eyeball jurisdictions are to say you need to transfer money to me. Okay. And I think many of them believe that if you could get it done on a per capita base too, 
Then, for example, Germany and France, which don't have very many of these multinationals but are high per capita and decent-sized population, would also be potential winners here. There are three new pieces here that are in Pillar A that are not currently part of the international tax rules now. The first piece is this so-called nexus piece where the current definition of what constitutes a taxable entity in a country, which we call a permanent establishment, that's a taxable entity, is going to be broadened to include virtual permanent establishments. How that definition is going to be made is not clear yet, but it could be any, in it, the, the widest it could be is any remote sales into a country automatically qualifies as a virtual permanent establishment and allows that country to go ahead and tax it. That's the first piece. The second piece is basically to force every multinational in this group to calculate its worldwide profits, which they currently don't do, on a unified basis, and then allocate those profits down through this complicated formula I was trying to explain to you. We call that unitary allocation. It's a term that's, I think, a brand new term, and I think William Burns came up with the term at uh, Texas A&M in the law school. It's a combination of treating the multinational as a unitary entity worldwide and using an allocation formula for allocating the money down through that complicated formula. Mm -hmm. And the third piece is these so-called market jurisdictions, which we aren't really clear about which who's in and who's out, <laughs> and creating an allocation key. That's formulary apportionment, global formulary apportionment, allocating that among these market jurisdictions. So these three components of the of the Mount A and Pillar in this uh, Pillar One are brand new. This um, Nexus One, which is a virtual permanent establishment. Second piece is this unitary allocation, which is a combination of making a multinational report on a worldwide basis its worldwide profits and then allocating them through a formula down to get a piece of the pie that is going to go to these so-called market jurisdictions, whether you count them by eyeballs or you count them by sales, and then using some sort of an allocation key, which is global formulary apportionment, to allocate that. Now, we do have formulary apportionment. It isn't, I mean, that is the piece of here that does exist. We have it inside the United States at the state level with the state compact for allocating the corporate income tax, and we have it with some of the provinces in Canada, but it has never been done worldwide. This is a completely new pillar. Uh, uh, this amount A and pillar one is brand new. It has three new components here. And they still have a ways to go, because even if everybody agreed on all of these, these new um, steps, they'd have to determine how they they reach them right like how the profits are divided and where the market yes. jurisdictions and are and so this is still yes. very big picture it feels like yes Marilyn. and then one of the really cool things about this is uh, there's been a very recent exchange this morning uh <laughs> between allison christians at mcgill university who's a law professor at mcgill who wrote a blog post complaining about the Pillar 1 meetings in, um, in Paris, saying that the OECD uh, secretariat had narrowed down the process on Pillar 1 and framed it in a way such that there were only very specific questions that could be handled. And, um, and Pillar 1 was not open for broad discussion. It was only very narrow. And there's been a response in another blog uh, posted from the OECD basically saying that Christians does not have it correct and that there's, she did not back up her assertion. And this gives me the opportunity to say Christians is right. Allison Christians is right. <laughs> and it's a complaint that we have in our own paper that uh, Oliver Tridler and I made. If you look at the question for the Pillar 1 hearing, they are very narrow technical questions that ask the same questions that you were just asking me, Mary Lynn. Okay. 
how do we know what a market jurisdiction is? How do we, um, uh, what are we going to use in terms of accounting to figure out the unitary profit? So in other words, the questions that people were asked to address in their responses to the Pillar 1 document were not about, is the Pillar 1 proposal a good idea, yes or no? Right. They were about assume the pillar, assume assume the unified approach is going through. How do we make it work? Right. And so I think Allison Christians was absolutely correct. The questions that were asked by the secretary were technical questions. Assume the unified approach is going through. How do we make it work? And the same thing is true of Pillar Two. If you look at the Pillar 2 questions, they are narrow, technical questions assuming Pillar 2 is going through. They are not asking about whether the OECD Secretariat's proposal is a good idea or not. Interesting. Interesting. Well, okay, so that's amount A. So what? tell us about amount B. Okay, amount B has a different story uh, behind it. And most multinationals, and I admit this is this has been this has been a BEPS one argument. In the original BEPS issue, one of the complaints of many countries like China, for example, were that uh, you had foreign multinationals that were selling in China, and they would set up a uh, a distribution affiliate, and they would say the distribution affiliate was performing routine activities, mm -hmm. and therefore only deserved a routine rate of return. Right. And in addition, what would happen is the parent, the multinational realized that if they fragmented the activities in China into smaller and smaller units, they could get them so small that they didn't even qualify as a permanent establishment. And if you don't qualify as a PE, you don't get counted. So, for example, under the old PE rules, if you had a warehouse, a warehouse was not a permanent establishment. So if I split out the distribution activities and the marketing activities and the warehouse activities and I chop them up into smaller and smaller pieces, I can avoid having a permanent establishment and then I avoid paying tax in, in China. And the Chinese government was rightly critical of that, absolutely. Okay. And some of the original uh, action items, the original 14 out of the 15 action items were designed to fix this. So, for example, one of them broadened the definition of permanent establishment. It got rid of the ability to fragment and chop up and try to avoid a PE. And was, was an, an idea behind this was to allow more profits to be made where things were sold. The second thing that was done in these BEPS items was the idea that it value where value was created, that's where taxes should be paid. And the argument would be, if you're selling into a country and you are marketing locally and you are creating and adding to the value of the brand, you should be paying more taxes there. So some of the machinations that were going on behind multinationals as ways to sort of make the money in China but shift the money elsewhere and make the money in India and shift the money elsewhere, the best action items were designed to fix that. Now. Amount B basically assumes they're not going to work. <laughs> Amount B basically assumes that the first 14 action items can't fix the problem. Now, there's no evidence to propose that. They've only been in place two years, and the data is just starting to come in now. But Amount B basically goes in and says, if you have um, marketing and distribution activities in our country, we're going to allocate you a minimum return. You don't get to pick. We are going to decide what a minimum return is, and that's what's going to be allocated to your jurisdiction. So basically, they're going to use a formula. They're not going to use the arm's length standards. They're not going to use the existing rules. They're just going to pick a number out of a formula and say 15% of your profits are allocated here simply because you're doing marketing and distribution. It's um, It has no... How should I say it? There is no theoretical or economic argument behind here, and it also um, assumes that the original BEPS proposals and actions won't have fixed the problem, which I think makes no sense. 
interesting. That's really interesting. Um, and then they've also noted amount C. Yes, amount C is, is kind of an odd little amount. Basically, it says if, if you don't think there was enough, you can ask for more. In other words, in B. Okay. If you don't think enough in B, you can ask for more. And, but you might have to go to court to fight about that. In other words, it could be a dispute settlement. The problem is in, in B, that once it's down, you, you can't appeal it. In other words, there's nowhere, nowhere, the, the only place where you can appeal A or B, you can't, is in C. So if you ask for a top up past C, so in effect, A and B are virtual grabs with no ability to really get an um, appeal through a dispute settlement mechanism. The only dispute settlement mechanism is, is tied to C, okay. if you ask for more over and above this. So you're saying if a country asks for more, like let's say if a company has 15% allocated to China, you can say, well, we want more profits. China could say, it wants 15% too low, you want 20 and that extra five might go to some sort of binding arbitration or dispute. It has to be a new dispute settlement mechanism. But the interesting thing about A and B is there really is, there'll be more disputes, but nowhere really to go in the sense that the existing system is set up to handle, is, is on a double tax treaty basis, bilateral tax treaty, mm -hmm. right? And so they're primarily between OECD countries. Very few developing countries have tax treaties. Okay. So if, if you have a dispute here, those that are OECD countries might be able to use the existing framework, but nobody else can. And, and so you're going to need, in some sense, some entity to handle amounts A and B. And the Secretariat has proposed doing it. So that, in effect, the Secretariat has proposed that it should become the organizational entity for handling amount A and B, and presumably for running the dispute settlement in C, which reminds me a little bit, frankly, of what happened on the 50th anniversary of the IMF and the World Bank when they started wondering about what their roles were with 50 years since the end of World War II and what what did they need to do as an organization to maintain its place? Uh, pillar one and pillar two, by the way, look very much like they might create a new uh, organizational role for the OECD secretariat. No one's talked about that yet, to my knowledge, other than the OECD proposing that they should do it, which would mean they would have to start hiring people. You want a job at the OECD? <laughs> <laughs> Well, and so you had also mentioned about Amount C that um, it, it, it could very likely lead to double taxation. I think uh, the answer is yes, because I think, and also A and B, because if you think about it, what's happening is if I carve, a, um, if I carve out a piece of the multinational pie for taxes for marketing jurisdictions, it has to come from somewhere. There's only three places that it could come from. One, it could come from multinational profits. So basically the multinationals pay more tax and take less after-tax profits. That's one. Second thing is it could come from the residence jurisdiction where the multinationals are headquartered. But that's only if they tax on a worldwide basis and only if they give a foreign tax credit. Very few countries do that anymore. And the U.S. rate's gone down to 21% now. So they if they gave a credit, would only give it up to 21%. Right. And I think it's highly unlikely that any, any U.S. government is going to give a foreign tax credit for amount A or amount B. And the third is source jurisdictions, that basically jurisdictions where the activities are taking place, they somehow give up a part of this too. So my my, my Suspicion is what will happen is the multinationals will take it on as an extra tax burden. But that has an, an, extra pro, an extra problem that people don't talk about either that Oliver talk, and I talk about a bit in our paper, which is we're economists and we understand the incidence of tax. Basically, when you put a tax on a firm, 
-hmm. Sometimes the firm absorbs and swallows the tax, and sometimes they pass it backwards onto their suppliers or onto their employees. But most of the time, it gets passed forward to consumers. Right. So these market jurisdictions that are going after these new tax revenues, if they're small and are price takers in international markets, they frankly are going to bear the burden of the tax themselves. That burden will fall on their own consumers. Mm -hmm. So the long run impact on this will actually be a transfer from um, the consumers in that country to their government. Right. Hmm. In the same way that I, you know, I sit here in Texas, I pay sales tax now uh, on my Amazon transactions. That's going to the state of Texas, and the state of Texas is using it for whatever. Right, right. So it's the consumers who are going to bear the burden in the end. In small countries, because, then, you know, they're immobile factors. The small countries are going to bear the burden of the tax, and it'll be passed to consumers. Yep. And one more interruption with our next CPE code word, and that word is complicated. As in, why did the digital economy have to go and make things so complicated for the digital transfer pricing world? But Lorraine, let's talk about your critique of Pillar 1. In the article, you mentioned Pillar 1 does not share the same agenda or empirical support as BEPS 1. Let's start with value capture disguised as value creation. What do you mean by that? What I mean is the, the BEPS 1 process was about base erosion and profit shifting and trying to fix the loopholes, right? But action items 8, 9, and 10 were about value creation. They were really about intangible and trying to figure out how do we tax the income from intangibles like patents and marketing intangibles and brand names and, and these sorts of things. And the, the proposal that came down that was in is now part of the 2017 OEC transfer pricing guidelines, is that where value is created, that's where profits should be declared, and that's where profits should be taxed. Now, the way I think about that is, suppose you have a value chain all the way from extraction of bauxite out of the ground in, say, Jamaica, and it turns into pots and pans that I have here, aluminum pots and pans I have here in College Station, Texas. All along that way, things happen from getting that raw material out of the ground into um, pots and pans that, say, I bought from some company. Uh, it, many hands touch this along the way. Okay. And so many hands create contributed to that. And the existing process we have used as economists for transfer pricing has been based on the arms length standards, looking at the functions, assets, and risks all along that chain. In other words, who did the function? Who had the roles? Who had the responsibilities? Who got stuff done? Right. Who put assets on the table, whether they were real assets or monetary assets or intangible assets? Who put those assets on the table? And who bore the risk? Right. involved in getting from a raw material to some product that I bought. And that's been the value creation. That was clarified in action items 8, 9, and 10 of the original BEPS action item. Now, if you read the Pillar 1 proposals, they basically say that's what's motivating this too. They say we're being motivated by BEPS base erosion and profit shifting and needing to fix the loopholes. And we're being motivated by um, value creation. But when you read the proposals, they've got nothing to do with value creation. It really is simply saying we have these enormous digital multinationals now, the big five, and who are making unbelievable profits now and have this unbelievable valuation, and we want a piece of that pie. It's like there are five golden geese out there, and we all want a piece of those five golden geese. And if they're selling in my jurisdiction, my government thinks it deserves a piece of those golden geese. Mm -hmm. And so you've got uh, 135 countries who all want a piece of those big five. And uh, so that's part of, I think, what's really driving this. And they all were going to do it by digital taxes. Let's tax. Them. It's a very quick and easy way to do it. 
is to the extent they divide, you know, they set taxes up wrong, they're really uh, import tariffs, and I think the WTO would likely eventually go after them, but not in the short run. Mm -hmm. So the OECD wanted to prevent this spread of these digital taxes, this, this uh, value capture, mm -hmm. not value creation, but value capture based on eyeballs. I think there's also, well, Oliver and I talked about this, a second agenda hiding in under here, other than what really is a political agenda of saying we want a piece of these golden geese. Um, the second agenda is there's been for a long time a, a small group of economists and a much larger group of law professors who want to, who really believes the arms length standard doesn't work and need to be replaced by global formulary apportionment. And we talk in our paper about this being a Trojan horse. It was a wonderful opportunity for the academics who believe in global formulary apportionment to bring this in uh, as part of pillar one. Mm -hmm. And you can see that because formulary apportionment is in amount A and formulary apportionment is in amount B and both amount A and amount B do not use the arm's length standard, do not use any of the existing rules that are in place. So basically, um, there's a quote in William Burns has a blog post that was out the other day, who basically, and he says in the quote on pillar one, it's like the OECD said, the only way to save a town is to burn it down. Interesting. And, Yes, and so when you think about that quote, that quote says it's almost like the only way to save the international tax system is to throw out all the existing rules and bring in new untried and untested stuff. Right. And it feels very much like that to me also. If Pillar 1 passed and formulary apportionment in amount A and amount B did replace the arm's length principle, would the arm's length principle still be relevant in non-digital company transactions? And I mean, honestly, every company is digital to an extent now, right? So remember that the very first step in doing amount A was to decide what industries were in. In okay. other words, it was a, a, a an industry scope question. Okay. And they said, we don't want to ring things. So we don't, in other words, they're not going to just tax the big five. Right. They don't want to ring fence to the top 100 digital multinationals. They wanted consumer facing. And, and so what's happening is you have a whole bunch of industries saying, we're not consumer facing, we're not consumer facing, we want out. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, if you start reading the proposals, um, you know, the, the responses that were and in, many of the firms are saying exactly that. We do not want in here to take us, carve us out. Mm -hmm. The pharmaceutical industry doesn't want in. You know, the mm -hmm. natural resources industry don't want in because and if they aren't in, they will stay under the old rule. So the, one of the real problems is if you start down this path with some industries doing it and remember not only some industries but some countries right. the likelihood of getting all the countries to sign on i think is close to zero mm -hmm. so some industries some countries and some transactions are involved think of the map and just to interrupt quickly to ask fiona fiona when we talk about the digital economy we often hear about new nexus rules what are the new rules about in the past, MNEs had to have a physical presence to have a taxable presence. The digital economy is throwing that for a loop. New Nexus rules are focused on MNEs having a taxable presence without a physical presence. Thank you, Fiona, and back to you guys. Yeah. You know, it's just like you, you, you only, not only have all the old rules, but you have the new ones too. It's like, you yeah. know, um, Microsoft is trying to force us all off Windows 7 now, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and I have to buy a new computer to move him. Um, but what if, you know, they allow us to keep both Windows 7 and Windows 10 and all running at the same time? Some things are running on one and some things are running on the other. You have to have two of everything, right? Right, right. So, so it becomes a, a major problem here. 
I think this is why the OECD Secretariat is wants this done, wants 135 countries signed on, and then wants to push it through the multilateral agreement, um, and then wants to have it imposed top down, enforced by the OECD, because they realize if there's anybody that says no and opts out, then you've got both. And the more opt out, and the fewer that stay in, you know, the, the, the more, think about any multinational, what, what are any of them going to do if the, some of the countries are in, some of the countries are out, yeah. or most multinationals have multiple uh, business lines. Sure. Suppose they have some digital business lines that are 100% digital. They have some lines that are half digital and half not, and some that are bricks and mortar. Right. How do they figure out what is what here? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I, I just think it's a nightmare waiting to happen. I can see where there would be a lot of confusion for sure and a lot of gray areas. I think there'll be a lot of a new loopholes. I mean, one of the if you look at the what the OECD has said, they said people want countries want simplicity. They want less dispute settlement. Mm -hmm. Multinationals want certainty. This is anything but. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because they've worked so hard and so consistently since, I don't know what year, 2013 with the BEPS initiative. And it's sort of like, they're, to, your, to your point about William Burns, they're burning it down. Yes, it feels very much, I think, to some of us like that, that we thought, I really felt pretty good about the BEPS project. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, and and I, I thought that really there were a lot of loopholes. There was egregious activity. I think most multinationals were good citizens and paid their taxes, but there were outliers. And, and I think fixing some of the problems made sense. And, you know, written papers basically saying, the loopholes were in the international tax rules, not in the transfer pricing rules. They were in the international tax rules. And they, I think, very much got fixed by the F1. Mm -hmm. And so my assumption was what we were going to see was the next few years, the introduction of BEPS one you know, C by CR, uh, the MLI, and all of these things going forward, and a lot of these loopholes be gone. Right. This thing came out of the blue, really, in January, with these proposals for the digital economy that started, and rightly so, I think worrying about how do we take account of digital transactions. But instead of saying some things I think that could have been done to tinker around the edges to fix it, and then uh, that's what Oliver and I did, we made, I think, six proposals that we thought were basically tinkering around the edges that would have handled the digital economy transactions. In other words, if you think there's a small group of things happening that are outliers, you can develop policies for handling the outliers. You don't have to impose all those policies on everything. Right. So, for example, the transfer pricing guidelines have rules for goods. They have rules for services. Sure. They have rules for intangibles. We could have had rules for digital transactions. Right. And that's one of the problems we made. Why don't we just have, work on a chapter on digital transactions? I do think the, um, the expansion of the permanent establishment uh, as one of the BAPS items could have been broadened a little bit more for virtual permanent establishment. And I talk in the paper about doing this specifically for investment, not for export. I, you know, you really can't just say all remote sales are virtual permanent establishments. They're not. A large chunk of them are simply imports coming into a country and if you want to tax those that's a tariff and tariffs fall under the wto right They're not corporate income tax uh, so we had proposed i thought what would have been pro really would have been a beps 2 solution rather than this cobbling together of different proposals to try and really throw over the existing system and replace it with something else what opposition do you have to replacing the arm's length principle with global formulary apportionment? Well, I've written a lot on this already, Matt, so let me just sort of summarize it. Um, number one, it's like replacing a, a fine tooth comb with a hatchet. <laughs> All right? A fine tooth comb 
the Iron Point standard is all about facts and circumstances. And it's really about looking at a set of transactions and trying to really understand what the firm was trying to do with those transactions. And they can be between two states. Like, I mean, they could be between Texas and California or, Texas or California and New York, for example. Because related party transactions also happen between states inside a country as well as within. Arms money transactions also happen inside organizations. Um, for example, Texas A&M has a whole bunch of colleges. And if a transaction happens from one college to another college, it has to be priced. That's transfer pricing. The arms life standard says how you should price that. So it's a, a general theoretical principle for pricing transactions between entities that are related to one another, either by equity or through control or through family ownership. The, and then when you use the arms life standard, it basically says come down and let's look at the facts and circumstances and understand the transaction. And it says let's talk about who did what. What functions were performed, right? What roles did you have to play? What did you put at the table in terms of assets? Did you, have, you know, take on any risks or were the risks all on the other side? Where was the value created? And then tries to divvy up the profits based on that value creation. And we've been doing this since 1935. Next year is the 85th anniversary in the United States of the arms length standard. We should be celebrating. <laughs> okay, formulary apportionment even within the United States, is about picking a couple of allocation teams, often sales or headcount of employees uh, or your property, plant, and equipment, and saying, let's divvy up the profits of the group based on those allocation teams. And as I said, we have some experience in doing this in the United States and a little bit of experience in doing this in Canada, but we really haven't done this much of anywhere else in the world. And the amount of money allocated to this is peanuts. I think it's less than 4% of the tax revenue at the state level in the United States is done by formulary apportionment. 4% of the revenues. I think that's the right number. It's, it's peanuts. So the proposal is to take an allocation key that is used inside the United States to raise very little revenue in the U.S. and, and do this worldwide right. for 135 countries yeah. uh, based on some, again, allocation key that looks like it's likely to be an eyeball or sales or some combination of eyeballs and sales. It ignores the facts and circumstances it doesn't take account of where value was created. It ignores the reality of what a business is at all. Mm -hmm. And just the other thing it does, interestingly enough, if you think about it, most of the value of a multinational is bound up in its intangible assets, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know that. The core competency of the multinational is its intangible. Well, they're not in the formula. So if I told you 60 or 70 percent of the value of a firm was in its intangible assets and I was going to measure it on the number of employees, you would say, well, that's not capturing the value. I mean, I admit that the labor force is some percent of the value, but what about the functions being performed and mm -hmm. the assets and the risks? Why don't you look at those things for who's creating value? Why don't you look at the value that's from in the intermediate goods and who made those and the intangible assets and the services performed. Global formulary apportionment looks easy. And, uh, it, and frankly, it, I don't believe it's easy to implement, but it looks easy on paper because it's a formula. And people like mathematical formulas because they look clean and neat. Mm -hmm. But the devil is in the details. And as someone who's worked a long time with multinationals and with tax authorities behind the scenes, I can tell you that there are a lot of details, and there is a lot of devil in those details. And slapping a formula on top and saying you're going to allocate them profits that way has no theoretical merit involved in it. And I think it'll actually create more problems and more distortions, more resource allocation distortions 
than the, the current system does. And you've described the unified approach as a muddling through approach. Can you explain what you mean by that? A muddling through, what I meant was there were a whole series of proposals that came from different national tax authorities in January. And the solution that was used was to try to, maybe better than muddling through would be to say cobbling through, was to cobble together the like parts of the different proposals and create this unified approach uh, to Pillar 1. And, and, and the, the Secretary admits it. What they did is they pulled the pieces that were common to the different proposals into one proposal. But I think what got made here was not a cake. It's not going to bake like a cake. It's not going to be a cake. It's going to be flat. But it's not going to taste very good. <laughs> that is. And I think it was it's a short-run expedient solution because the group of 20 imposed on themselves originally they were going to be done by 2020. And they want to be done by 2020 and move on to other things. Um, but I think this approach is in the wrong direction and will not only solve the not not solve the problem it'll actually make the situation much worse and I think that just about wraps up our discussion. We're on to the rapid fire questions, what we want to know. We have a transfer pricing expert in the hot seat. Today, that's Lorraine. And they answer for us uh, some more general life-based questions uh, about their careers. Uh, Lorraine, are you ready? I guess I'm ready. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm going to be. If your students take one lesson away from their time with you, what would you want it to be? Work on something you're passionate about. It'll keep you going and excited about what you do the rest of your life. Love it. Finish this sentence. If I weren't a transfer pricing expert, I would be some sort of oh, dream job, I, I guess. Would, if, I, if I hadn't, um, I started learning computers. I started learning computers when when there were cards. So I showed you how old I am. And I hated the cards, so I really didn't. But I've been a computer geek all my life. And I love to do digital photography. I would have gone to Texas A&M and gone to Viz Lab and gone off and done something digital. Fun. Uh, what's your favorite book and why? Oh, oh, gee, my favorite book. I, I know oh, this. Yeah, you've got me. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. One. No, I'm not sure. My favorite book. If I had to take one book with me, where what would it? that would keep me going. Oh, I would probably take Anna Green Gates. I was a red-headed little girl from um, family originally from PEI, just like Anna Green Gables, and I've always loved that book. A little girl that really asks lots of questions, doesn't take no for an answer, gets into lots of scrapes, but has a lot of fun. Sounds like your career in transfer pricing. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, how has teaching become easier? As teaching become easier? Well, I, I don't know that it's become easier. I actually think to do a good job, it may be harder now. Uh, there are so many things you have to be uh, maitre chez nous. For example, we, when I started out, we had secretaries. Don't have any secretaries anymore. But when I started out, there were lots and lots of librarians who would help you do things. There are fewer and fewer of those. Um, when I started out, I didn't have computers. Um, now I have to be manage a computer. I have to manage a variety of students. I have to answer questions to students from all over the world. I have to be prepared to run Zoom and talk to students on Zoom. Uh, I think the, the, the role of a faculty member these days is a multi, much more multifaceted now than when I started out the profession in the, in the 70s. My, my next question was actually going to be, how has it become more challenging? So I don't know if you can think of any ways it's become slightly easier in contrast. I can, Matt. One of the ways I think it has become easier is I think it's maybe easier to some extent to be a not very good teacher in the following way. If you, teach, if you teach courses digitally online, you have your lectures all pre-prepped, and they've been pre-prepped five years ago. 
Yep. And you just have to get together and answer a few questions, and you grade on Scantron cards that are all run digitally through digital tests. I think you can deliver a not very good product much easier now than you used to. In the old days, you had to stand up in front of students and you actually had to conduct a class. Right. Now you can sign on and do a digital course and really not do very much. I mean, those big MOOC classes exist because they don't take very much of faculty members' time. But for the 99% of the rest of us who are faculty members at university, we are working much harder. Thank you very much, Lorraine. We really appreciate it. Can you tell why this woman is a teacher or what? Lorraine, thank you so much for a terrific discussion. Thank you for being here and giving us just an in-depth look at Pillar One. Just curious, who's still a fan of Pillar One? No judgment, just curious. Spoiler alert, her podcast on Pillar Two is coming soon. While that concludes our episode, it doesn't have to be goodbye. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and we'll talk to you about transfer pricing every week. Don't forget our sister podcast, The Fiona Show, Hot Off the Press, where you'll learn about transfer pricing in the news. Learn about it there and listen as we dissect it here. Not a bad setup, right? This podcast was engineered, edited, and hosted by Matthew DeMello. He also wrote our fabulous news section. Our executive producer, Marilyn Mitchum-Strom, writes our scripts. That may be it for today, but certainly not the last on Pillar One and certainly not the last from Dr. Lorraine Eden. Catch you next week, everybody. 